It's half time now at the International Stadium in Yokohama, and Ireland can dare to breathe after that wonderful finish by Jason McAteer, putting the ball past Marcos and into the corner of the net. And Keane's dominance of the midfield has thrown Brazil's game plan completely out the window. Ronaldo looks lost with little to do but pray. This is Ireland's World Cup for the taking. Half time here in Yokohama. Ireland won, Brazil nil. This is Saipan, base camp for the Republic of Ireland for the next five days. Saipan, the small island in the Western Pacific where manager Mick McCarthy took his squad away from the fans and the world's media before travelling on to Japan. So a few more days here gives the players a chance to retune their body clock for the Asian Pacific time zone. My understanding was it was training and, and of course, uh, you know, a few nights out or whatever it was and, and, and to get the lads even closer together. I think it's important to have a good togetherness within a group. You're over in a, in a different country anyway, so you want to be away from everyone else. After travelling for 24 hours from Ireland, the team went for their first training session. The manager arrived, the players arrived, but the kit did not arrive. The kit never turned up. You know, we, we trained on the training ground. It was dry and long, the grass, which didn't help. When the kit goes missing and that's not there at Saipan for the first day of training, it's difficult. And then Ray's already, at the moment, he's not, he's not happy with it. And then we go to the training pitch and the training pitch is horrendous. He's obviously had his exchanges about the preparations. And then he arrives in Saipan and it's a disaster zone. He was coming from an environment where he got everything he needed to be able to perform and then coming into a place where it wasn't there. He's walking around that place like a time bomb. I threw out with the team. I was there from the moment they touched down in Saipan and I watched very strange kind of change in him over the days. There was angry Roy and nice guy Roy. And they were constantly at war. These two guys were butting off each other. The kit arrived the next day and things were back on track, but not for long. The goalies with their coach, Packy Bonner, did a training session before the rest of the team arrived. When Roy wanted the goalies for a practice match, Bonner refused. We have a game at the end of training, but we don't have no goalies. So he's already losing his head. I remember him taking his top off, having a vest on and thinking, oh no, he's losing his head. Leaving the training session furious, Roy approached Mick that evening. He'd had enough. He wanted out and to quit the World Cup. Mick asked, well, why are you going home? It's not you, Roy says, it's me. And that was true. It was him. It was, it was, this was the two boys in his head, going head to head like that. This is what it was all about. I think he was looking for an excuse to go. He was homesick. See the way he loves his dog and his walks and his routine and his big house and the gates go across. Nobody can touch me here. I'm safe. He wasn't safe out there. He was going to be three weeks away from home with people that he could tolerate, if you want, for a training session, tolerate for breakfast. But other than that, he started getting a bit antsy. Oh dear, oh dear. 14 minutes past seven. Now, what is Roy Keane up to? Threatening to walk out of the preparations for the World Cup and take himself home. Tony O'Donoghue was on the line from Site Pan. It was a bit of a shock to say the least when I come off training. I didn't, obviously, I didn't want him to go home and try to talk him out, but uh, there was no way I was, I was going to do it. As Ireland awoke to the shocking news, Roy had phoned his agent, Michael Kennedy, and the gaffer, Alex Ferguson. He let off steam and they convinced him to stay. And then the next morning, I seen him in the treatment room and he was getting a strap in. And I said to him, I thought you were going home, like I used to take the mickey out of him. So I thought you were going home. And he just, he gives that silly grin he's got, hasn't he? He gives that grin. 
This morning, he lashed out at the Republic of Ireland's pre-tournament preparation, describing their training pitch in Saipan as shocking. A lot of people say, well, it's typical of Roy, and Roy should really shut up, but I can't. I can't, especially if I'm captain of the team. We come over here, we travel halfway across the world, and the training pitch is a disgrace. And somebody's got somebody's to hold a hand up and say, it's like training on a car park. Bloody rock hard. You've had one or two injuries already, and I expect a few more. I think the wisest thing would be uh, to stay quiet until it was over. Uh, no, because sense, John. We could do it without this controversy at this particular stage. Ah, John, now, get off the yard. After his change of heart, Roy took part in a good training session the next morning. The team were back together. In the afternoon, the players went for a round of golf. But Roy didn't really care for golf. So instead, he met with a bunch of journalists. First up was Paul Kimmage from the Sunday Independent. Roy hates golf. He can't understand why these guys are out playing golf. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's totally irrational. And he goes off on one about his teammates. And it's very obvious from what he says about them, he does not respect them. And again, they're getting into really dangerous ground here because doesn't respect the manager, doesn't respect the player. Major interview with, with Sunday newspapers on the eve of the World Cup. This is going to cause a shitstorm. Straight after Paul Kimmage, Roy did another interview with former Irish Times journalist Tom Humphreys. Again, he lets off steam about the FAI, the facilities, and mentions some teammates by name. The article was intended for Saturday's Irish Times, but was so contentious, it was published the next morning instead. I was really struck by the language in it, because it was very, very raw. I knew there was going to be trouble. Had to be trouble, because it really was a challenge. There will always be journalists hanging around these events. One of the things in the, in the camp that you would have thought that there would have been control and the, the media, media output. And at the end of the day, it's like a few people off, you know. You know, I think he had a go at me in something as well, and I thought, that's a bit harsh. You know, so I was a bit like... Thinking matters were settled, Mick then becomes aware of Roy's TV interviews, radio interviews and press interviews, slagging off the team and their preparation. It was time for a meeting. You know, Mick comes in and he addresses, we're leaving, pay your bills, we're traveling this tracksuit, this polo top, blah, blah, blah. And then he, uh, the last thing he does is he, he opens the article and he says, Roy, I need to talk to you about this. Mick comes in with the paper and I'm like, God, oh, here we go. And then that's it. And this crazy, just arguing amongst each other and you just thinking to yourself, why? Why has this happened? It's someone knocking on Roy's window saying, Roy, hold on, Roy, need to talk here. Explodes. You're a fucking and you're a fucking and I don't rate you as a manager and I don't rate you as a person. It was like, it was like a personal argument. Why miss the biggest game of all our international careers with Ireland to date? Why pull out of the Iran match? You're a crap player and you're a crap manager. The only reason I have any dealings with you is that somehow you're manager of my country. You're not even Irish. Put my head under the table because obviously I'm born in England as well. So I think, I hope he's not coming for me yet. Well, if you don't respect me, then you can't play for me. You want me to piss off, don't you? You want me to piss off? You know what you can do? You can stick the World Cup up your bollocks! Well, I just gave up and he's just, right, that's it, I'm off. And he left and he was kind of like, whoa. Mick had to move fast, and soon the world would know about an island called Saipan. I can't, will not, tolerate, uh, well, not being spoken to like the, the, the level of abuse that was thrown at me, so I have uh, sent him home. Good evening and welcome to 6-1. The Republic of Ireland manager Mick McCarthy has been defending his decision to send team captain Roy Keane home from the World Cup. 
World Cup Keen. preparations are in chaos this evening after their captain and best player on Mick McCarthy, Roy Keane, the Master Squad. Somebody told me that there was a bust up in Saipan. I think nobody in Ireland really knew where Saipan was, including me. Almost within a few hours, everybody seemed to be talking about Saipan. Uh, Mick McCarthy was ashen faced. I've never seen him look so shocked. He felt, though, that his position as manager was undermined. He said he can't. If you're Mick McCarthy and these things are said about you, it's very hard to not feel slighted and hurt. And I can't go on in a situation where this person is here having said those things about me. The whole situation could have been handled a lot better from both parties, but I think, in particular, the manager, I think he could have brought Roy Keane in and said, look, get him on side and, and work through it together as such, rather than making it, making it as public as it was. And then we're leaving, I don't know what time, eight or nine in the morning, we get on the coach, and everyone's got their own place on the coach. It's kind of like a bit of superstition goes on. And his was the back corner, and um, someone had wrote, someone had wrote, I think, R.I.P., where his seat was. Alone at last, Roy Keane checked in at Saipan Airport on the first leg of his journey home. Even tell us how you're feeling at the moment. Feel uh, very good. Clear conscience. And I'm happy to be going home. Their devastation. In the 88th minute, Ronaldo did what Ronaldo does and stuck it in the bottom right corner. We're now heading into 30 minutes of extra time. It's in the lap of the gods. Republic of Ireland won, Brazil won. It's the news at one. This is Sean O'Rourke. Good afternoon. The headlines this Thursday lunchtime. Preparations for Ireland's World Cup soccer campaign have been thrown into disarray after the captain Roy Keane was ordered home. The team manager... There was a passionate uh, feeling uh, by the people uh, in this country that this could be reconciled uh, in some way. Uh, everyone, I think, would not alone be happier, but probably would be sleeping happier. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'd missed, obviously, the 12 o'clock or whenever it broke, I'm not sure. I said, uh, Michael, he's not going. And he said, what? I said, they're after sending him home. And he just literally burst into tears. As Roy made his way home, the country had only one thing to talk about. I can't believe that you're all finding Roy Keane innocent. I cannot believe that. I think it's about 50 50. It's not about what Roy Keane wants, it's about what Ireland wants and what the manager wants and the staff that work with him. Okay. Um, not Roy Keane. It's only the Irish who will send the greatest player in the world, probably at this time, home and cheat the fans, cheat the nation, John, of the opportunity of the of enjoying something we've worked for hard for for four years. And I know you're a good guy, John. You're one of the reformers of Marion Square. The disgraced Ireland football captain Roy Keane is back at his home in Cheshire this evening. Keane was thrown out of the squad after a row with the team manager Mick McCarthy. Keane lived in this house in a fancy area outside Manchester. There was an electronic gate there and a high wall. So then it was just a waiting game. Next thing, Keen appeared, and the dog. Mr. Keen, can we have a word with you? Can it you was me? like the entry of Spartacus. Here, please. Unpredictable as ever, 
Roy Keane took his dog and a pack of news hounds for a walk almost as soon as he arrived home in Cheshire this morning. He was saying, you will not take my privacy away from me. If I don't come out through these gates today, you're winning. So, you're not winning. I'm walking my dog. Any regrets at all? Glad to be home, Mr. King. As a defiant challenger of the system, he's box office. Whether or not the people of Ireland support Roy Keane, like them, he'll be watching the World Cup from home. Yeah, we're in Tokyo, so the news is flashed, and I'm looking, I'm saying, yeah, he's just walking a dog, and you just think to yourself, he shouldn't be walking a dog, he should be here with us, training with us, so it was disappointing, to be fair. Do you feel as if you'd had a death in the family? Yeah, it was hard to explain, Mark, you know, how I felt last night. I was going around like a bit of a zombie, but I'm just not, it just... It was just, I couldn't believe what was happening. Hello, Paddy. Hello, yeah. The... Um, you have just burned your, your MU shirt. I have, yeah. In protest. In protest. Yes. While tempers rose and opinions mounted, the FAI were quick to get their side of the story out. Roy really pushed the ball out a little bit too strong for both the players and the management. And team morale is paramount here. It's not an ideal situation, but it's one we have to live with. Mick effectively ended any chance of Roy Keane appearing at the World Cup Finals. All 22 of us voted unanimously to back him. I'm devastated Roy Keane is not here. It's been very emotional, to be honest with you. And it's been very sapping you know, on, on the brain. I'm not pleased that he's going home, Vincent. No, uh, no, 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 I'm not asking yeah, ask you about what pleases uh, or anything. I, I, ask what I ask you, how do you think team morale is now? The lesser of two evils. Roy King was fed up by the way he was being portrayed and the things that were being said about him. And he was going to do, you know, one interview in Ireland. This evening, in his first major television interview since his dismissal, Roy Keane speaks about the events which led to his departure from Ireland's World Cup squad. He spoke this afternoon to Tommy Gorman. The deal was that we'd put it out warts and all, no editing. What I first want to do is to get you to put in context the reasons for your row. Um, I think there's a lot of things. Obviously, there's a lot been said over the last few days. Um, I'm not really here to get anybody on my side. I think it's important that people know the truth. Where he got kind of angry, and given where he was, I think it's justified. This very notion that he would have feigned injury or he would have ducked his responsibilities. But how about the actual language? And that he was justified in feeling hurt by it. Justified in questioning my loyalty to my country. Asking the lads in front of me, saying the Iran match, I faked an injury when he spoke to my manager in front of me. He knew I wasn't right. I said to him at the minute, I said, you're a liar, but I'm not going to accept that. Not in front of my teammates and the staff. And I, I, wouldn't, I won't accept it. I will not accept it. But will you accept I think there was a huge element of self-preservation to the Tommy Carmen interview. It had caused such an absolute storm that he would have to protect or would want to protect his reputation. I want to play for Ireland. Mm. We'll have to see. Possibly, yes. But I, there's nobody wants to play for much as Ireland as me. That last question I put in was almost like just to check for myself, is that true? Or I says, it's hurting you, this. It's hurting you, this. Oh, of course it's hurting me. Dead right it is. Dead right. That was enough confirmation for me that this guy is not 100% comfortable being back in Manchester. Tommy Gorman interview is the first time that the story changes because this is the first time that Irish women really lay their eyes on Roy Keane and go, Jesus, he's a ride. He looks absolutely beautiful. And I can just feel the men and women around Ireland melting. Girls who I'd known and worked for years, 
Roy Keane is a ride. Why didn't anybody tell us? Shortly after 7.30, fans took to the streets demanding that Keane be recalled to the squad. Do you think that Roy should apologise? No. 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 no! 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 Definitely not. He's nothing to apologise for. Tony, we've had confirmation here that the Taoiseach's officer, that the Taoiseach himself, intervened unofficially in this row. Is there any word of that on the ground out there? There was a, a suggestion put to me. It came through Tommy Gorman. That would, would I uh, help? Supporters had been pinning their hopes on the Taoiseach's intervention. A spokesperson for Bertie O'Hearn said the Taoiseach had made contact with the FAI and with Roy Keane through a third party. When Tony Blair and I were doing the Northern Ireland peace process, we rarely had all the parties in the one room. What you did was you, you, you separated one side and the other. But what was required was to try and get the two people involved um, either together or to listen to one side and then listen to the other side separately and then try and find a common ground to bring them together. I mean, that's what was required uh, if called upon. And I readily said I would, uh, but was never called upon. He's not like the um, others, like Niall Quinn today and like um, Steve Staunton, who sort of rode in behind Mick. I would too if I was 35 and at the end of my career. Of course I'd lick him. No, I was delighted that he left. Delighted? I was delighted, yes, because this man has held this uh, country to ransom for the last 10 years. I blame nobody, only the FAI, the management and the John Giles media. While the blame game continued at home, 6,000 miles away, the Irish squad had other things on their mind. What people think about me, I can't change. What I've ever done for Ireland, for my country, is play as well as I could, manage as best I could. And I do know something, I think I've done a damn good job of it. Get behind them guys. Let's see if we can do well in this World Cup. Support them. Battling the stifling heat, Ireland played their first group game against Cameroon. Still looking for Mboma. Mboma! Yeah, obviously Cameroon was there's pressure because it's the first game. You always say in a, in a major tournament, you know, don't lose your first game. You have to get off to some sort of positive start. You one 0 down at half time. That's come out to Holland. Quad one. Matty Holland has put Ireland right back in the match. The public reaction, where are we going to say Where are we going? Where are we going to say? Crap. This is crap. Crap manager. Crap manager. Where are we going to say Pat? I'm sorry. First game against Cameroon. Boiling heat. They were outrunning Cameroon at the end of that game. That is a truly magnificent result by Ireland. That result against Cameroon was a vindication for what he'd done in terms of preparation. But he'll be a very, very happy man. I think he done really well to regroup the team after what happened. If he had have gone out against Cameroon and lost the game, things would have turned very quickly. Next up, Ireland faced the might of Germany. Fast your seatbelts, the roller coaster is ready to rock. This was a serious German side. They were decent. Closer! Playing against Germany, one of the best teams around at the time, and no one's given us any hope whatsoever in that game. There's just magic moments, just a long ball up to Big Quinny. Just flicks it on, and Robbie's anticipation is fantastic. And here's Robbie Keane! Yes! Talking about the hairs in the back of my neck stand up, you know, it, it was it was absolutely brilliant. Robbie Keane could well have put Ireland into the second round. To get a draw against Germany is just one of the best things you'll, you'll ever see ever, especially when they're one of the favourites to go and win the World Cup. Every individual person in the team has collectively tries to go that extra yard to go and to prove to people that we can win football matches without Roy Keane. It takes two years to get to a World Cup. It, you know, a lot of tears, a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice and effort. He was the best midfielder in the world. It was his stage, it was his time to shine. I'm gutted he missed that World Cup. I wish it never happened. Ireland beat Saudi Arabia 3-0 
and were into the last 16, where they met Spain in the knockout stages. We all take it. We all once again. What is this? The squad felt good. The confidence was really high in the camp. For every game that came, we were excited to play, and obviously we're at the knockout stage now, you know, because no room for error, uh, or you're or on the plane home. Look on if you dare. Yes! And Ireland are level through Robbie Keane. The Spain game was, was, you know, even now, it still hurts a bit because we felt we'd done enough in the game to actually go through before the penalties at us. Mendieta against Shea Gibbon. And a remarkable, heroic odyssey for Mick McCarthy's Ireland is over. What I learned was the public's insatiable appetite for stardom uh, and for success. And that anything that gets in the way of that is going to suffer. It really did split the nation 50-50 because even now to this day when I talk to people, it's always kind of like, oh, Roy or Mick, who are you with? You know, it's, it's always that conversation. It, it was just so sad. I think for both Mick McCarthy and Roy Keane, so sad for the entire team, but more so, so sad for Ireland. Two decades later, and the argument still lives on as to who was right and who was wrong. I think Mick McCarthy made the biggest mistake ever. It was a sad day for Irish football. Basically, if you're a sport from Cork, I sport Manchester United, you're on one camp, and either camp, the other camp was against. That's the way I seen it. Because you can't do any wrong in Cork, obviously, Man United either. But he should have just played on for the sake for Ireland, really. Roy was a professional, you know, and he's, you know, he wanted things done 100 percent to what he thought was right. Like, you know, so if I was in this situation, I would have probably done the same. So what if? What if Roy had stayed and everyone managed to just get along? If Roy had played, we would have won it. No doubt about it. If Roy was playing against Spain, we would have won that match. I have no doubt about that. We will never know, but yeah, if he was there, maybe he would have gave us that extra 2 or 3% which we needed. And yeah, I, I would have probably have said, probably beat South Korea and Germany and probably, yeah, gone to the semi-final. We would have beat Spain with, with Roy playing. We would have beat him. And then who knows where we would have ended up. You know, we might have surpassed the great 90 achievements of quarterfinals. God only knows, um, you know, we could have got sent off in the first minute, you know, against Spain. Well, I was in Japan and the players that we met from the Irish team were on fire. The spirit was galvanised. The fact that Keane wasn't there, there is an argument to be made that they were freed, that they were released from the shackles of having to deal with this perfectionist. The jury's out as to whether Ireland would have been better with Roy Keane. Who knows? <laughs> For the crystal ball, I can tell you, but I don't. So it's no, no one will ever know. My, my, how things have changed. Penalty shootout, Brazil five, Republic of Ireland four. This one has to go in. Who's going to be Ireland's penalty taker? It's, it's, it's Roy Keane. Keane has emerged from the huddle to put himself forward, to take the penalty, to keep Ireland within touching distance of winning the World Cup. It's every kid's dream. He wasn't a penalty taker during his career. This was going to be the moment to, you know, put the cap in his career. And he was obviously saying, I'm captain, I'm taking it. It's over the bar. Ireland's World Cup dream is over. It was amazing. I mean, we came back to a hero's welcome and, you know, I've got the medal. Well, it's in my mum's loft, the World Cup medal. There's only one thing better than that, and that's winning it. 